Hi, everyone. Welcome to our multimodality imaging lecture series. It's a great pleasure today to introduce uh, Carlos Colette, uh, who will be talking about a CT guided PCI to a novel approach for anatomical and functional guidance during percutaneous revascularization. Uh, I'm very excited in particular about this topic. I think he's, he's an interventional cardiologist. He's originally from Venezuela. Uh, he did his cardiology training and interventional cardiology training in Brazil, and then moved to Amsterdam to do a PhD uh, focused on the expansion of the, the use of uh, cardiac CT. He has published extensively with over 200 publications with a recent uh, JAX state-of-the-art review on how to integrate uh, cardiac CT in the cath lab. Uh, I think what he's doing is uh, extremely unique, so I'm very excited for everyone to, to see his presentation. So thank you very much, Carlos, for joining us today. Thank you, Leandro. It's really, for me, a pleasure to be in this forum, Montefiore. Uh, I'm really honored to be here, and, and thank you very much for this kind introduction. And as you mentioned, this is something that we have been working and developing since the last uh, three, five years, and we call it City Guide PCI. So without further ado, let's uh, start discussing what it is about. And uh, as a background, we know that, well, we as uh, cardiologists now are using more and more CT, but we're using CT mainly as a non-invasive test to determine whether there is presence of obstructive CAV, and this is the classical use of, of CT. In addition to CT, you know, FFRCT, it's helping us identifying the lesions that we see in CT that are functionally significant. But in addition to, uh, to tell us whether the lesion is significant, FFRCT is also able to provide us with a pattern of CAV. I'm not talking about focal and diffuse disease. I'm gonna show a couple of examples. This is a typical case of three vessel disease. And you see here in the FFRCT model that everything that is blue, when it's blue, it means that the FFR is very high. And you see that after the lesions, it becomes red that means that the FFR actually is uh, significant and you see here in the three vessels. But beyond this uh, characterization of the lesion as significant or not, we can also derive from FFRCT the pattern of CAV, which in my view is an extremely important information to define the appropriateness of PCI. And you see here in the screen from right to left, more focal lesions, you see that a very focal type mid LAD lesion on the right side. And in the bottom of the slide, you see the FFRCT pullback curve with a clear pressure step up at the level of the lesion. Exactly the opposite happens on the left extreme of the, of the slide, where you see a case of diffuse coronary artery disease, where it's actually no clear target for PCI and the pressure loss is actually diffuse. So FFRCT has this potential to help us beyond lesion significant understand also the appropriate of PCI. And we have a novel tool. This novel tool is called the FFRCT planner that is an integral component of the CT guided PCI. For the ones who are not familiar with the FFRCT planner, this is a tool that mimics PCI uh, uh, and tries to predict post PCI FFR. But I have to tell you, and we're gonna see this at the end of the presentation, that is not only about the prediction of FFR, it goes beyond that. Why post-PCI FFR is important? I show you data of the biggest individual patient level meta-analysis. This is 2,500 patients. And what you see on the screen is only cardiac death and MI. And it has been stratified by the post-PCI FFR value. And you see here on the left side of the screen that when you look at this in, in a capillary curve, and you see here that the patients with low post-PCI FFR have an increased risk of cardiac death and MI compared to those with uh, high post-PCI uh, FFR. When we look at the right side of the, of, the, of the slide, we realize that this is not a dichotomous uh, uh, information. Uh, the post-PCI FFR, I mean, is more like a continuous uh, uh, metric meaning that lower post-PCI FFR values are associated with more with higher risk of the, in this case, cardiac death and myocardial infarction. So the ability to predict post-PCI FFR actually opens the door to a better patient selection for a PCI. And we are in a post-ischemia era where it's extremely important to understand what are the ways, mechanisms, or technologies that could help us better identify the patients that actually benefit from PCI. In this regard, we think that until now, the clinical usefulness of CT 
to plan and guide coronary interventions has remained unexplored. And this is what we have developed, and this is the focus of the, of the presentation. So what we have uh, done is actually created a very easy algorithm, which has three pillars. The first one is the diagnostic evaluation and the treatment planning using the FFR and the FRCT planner. The second part is how we prepare the CAT lab. And I'm pretty sure that the intervention is in the CAT lab in the, in, the, in, the, in the meeting will appreciate how we use coronary CT to prepare not only the personnel, but also the materials that we're going to use for that specific intervention. And lastly, I think it's, it's something that is super exciting. It's the first time that we actually have the CT inside the CAT lab providing us information while we're doing the procedure. And this is the third pillar of the algorithm. And we're gonna look at all of this today. So if we try to dissect this algorithm a little bit further, we have again, the first part where we're gonna talk, we're talking about lesion significance and the, risk, the prediction of the PCI results. And I'm gonna tell you the, that we have validated the FFRCT planner in a study called P3, where we prospectively validated the post-PCI FFR prediction, of course, again, invasively measured post-PCI FFR. This paper is going to be published or online probably in the next two weeks in JAK Imaging. The primary objective of this study was actually to assess the agreement between the planner prediction and the invasively measured post-PCI FFR. And in my view, this is, was an extremely rich study because we, of course, had the patient with a, with a CT beforehand, then the patient went to, the, to, to a normal angio. During the angio, we did OCT, and the OCT was done pre and post PCI. And of course, we also have FFRCT. From the invasive functional perspective, we did motorized FFR pullbacks. So we took a motor, we put it on the table, we adapted the pressure wire to this motor, and then we pulled back the wire and this allow us to have a complete map of the pressure along the coronary vessel. Having that for us then was very easy to match the information that came from the invasive uh, uh, part compared to, uh, to the FFRCT values. And we did this, as you see in the screen, matching one by one of the points. In addition to that, we were able to co-register not only with the angiography, but also with the CT and the OCT. So this was a relatively moderate size study. We included 120 patients. You see the baseline characteristics on the screen. And it was a typical PCI trial. The mean age was 64 years old. Diabetes was present in about 24% of the cases. And you see on the screen the clinical presentation. Most of the lesions treated were LAD. And in around half of the patients, the, in half of the vessels, the lesions were classified as being complex according to the AHA classification of B2 and C. You see the other uh, procedural characteristics also on the screen. But in a nutshell, what we, did, what we did was this. So we had the baseline information. Here you see the FFRCT. We also recorded the position of the, of the FFR measurement. We co-registered these two. And these are the pullback curve obtained from the invasive FFR in yellow and from the FFRCT in blue. And you see here how nicely these two correspond. So we did the PCI, the PCI was guided by OCT. And after PCI, we repeated exactly the same. So we repeated the FFR uh, pullback with the motor and of course, angiography and OCT. And this is what we found. I'm gonna give you a premise. Again, this, this is impressed. The mean difference between the prediction of the FFRCT planner and the invasive FFR was 0.02. So this tool is, is accurate. And in addition to that, it's also precise. The standard deviation of the mean difference was 0.07. And you see here the mean FFRs and standard deviation observed with both invasive and uh, post-PCI FFRCT. We went beyond the simple assessment of the agreement between the FFRCT and the FFRCT planner in all the, the, the population. We went further to define what was the accuracy of this tool in different scenarios that are very complex for us in the CAT lab. For example, diffuse disease of calcific lesions. The way that we have defined diffuse disease is by uh, using the FFR pullbacks. We have developed this uh, technique called the PPG. So the PPG is a tool that is based on FFR pullbacks and allows us to differentiate focal from diffuse disease. High PPG close to one, that means uh, focal disease and low PPG is close to zero that reflects diffuse disease. So we use this actually to 
uh, understand the accuracy of the planner in these two different disease subtypes. If you want to learn more about the PPG, we published this paper in JCC a couple of years ago. We also look at calcium, and the way that we look at calcium is by a metric that we defined recently called calcium burden that actually correlates with the calcium that we see in OCT. And from these two metrics, we actually use the medium to assess what was high and what was low. In this slide, you see the accuracy of the FFRCT planner stratified by the calcium burden. You see the first column, patient with low calcium, and you see that the main difference between the post-PC FFR and the FFRCT planner was similar uh, to cases with high calcium. So there is no penalty to use this tool in high calcium burden. And if you want to assess this visually, this is how the bland element plots look like, low calcium on the left, high calcium on the right. What concerns focality or diffuseness of the disease, here is again the same analysis, but now it's stratified by the PPG. So low PPG reflecting diffuse disease and high PPG focal disease. You see here how the accuracy, accuracy of the tool remain independent of the disease pattern. I'm talking about again, focal or diffuse. And this is the bland Alman plots confirming the values that I showed you before. So that is the first part of the algorithm. And I'm, we're gonna look at the planner at the end of the presentation. We'll probably do some uh, live cases if I am able to share the, the, the iPad of the planner here with you. But let me go uh, forward with the presentation. And the second part of the algorithm, the algorithm is about to really prepare ourselves and plan the procedure before we actually go inside the lab and make the first injection. I have always thought as an interventional cardiologist, we are one of the unique specialities that we go inside a case without actually knowing anything of what we are going to find. And sometimes we have to decide what to do in about 10, 30 seconds. So this is something that struck me when I started my training in interventional cardiology. But now look at this case, Leandro. This is a case from my consultation. This is a patient coming with angina. And you see that this patient has severe uh, left main stenosis. These are three MPRs uh, of the CT. On the left, you see the right coronary that is normal. And here you see the LAD, where you see a big, big plaque burden in the distal part of the left main, a very severe stenosis in the distal left main, and here a couple of calcified nodules in the proximal part of the, of the LAD. Here you see the same, in the, looking at the CERC, and the CERC actually has no disease in the, in the ostium. So you see how much information we can extract from a CT performed actually in the workup of the patients with suspected coronary artery disease. And if you want to take a zoom, this is how these left main look. So what allowed uh, this information was one, to talk with the patient, explain him, you have a severe left main stenosis, it has to be fixed. There is no discussion about it. And then we started the discussions with the surgeons and with the patient on what would be the best approach to treat these patients. So we actually had the heart team meeting with the CT before deciding what was the best treatment strategy for that particular patient. We, had, we finally decided to go for PCI because we thought that the anatomy based on CT was uh, completely normal. But the, what happened next is that when we start our invasive procedure, we are completely prepared. We know what we're going to find. This is not an emergency in the cat lab. This, we, are, we, we know what we're going to see. We already started with a seven French guiding catheter. We know exactly that we need two wires. We have the two uh, inflators ready to do the PCI. And of course we have our imaging ready because we, we treat, we'd like to treat left main disease with either intravascular imaging, OCT or IVUS. So this is the way that the CT can really help us to prepare us, ourselves better uh, when we go to the cat lab. The last part of the algorithm is actually looking at plaque composition. When we understand plaque composition based on CT, that is uh, actually straightforward to look at. We can identify the landing zones and we can extrapolate the, the concept that we have from the intravascular field. And I'm thinking about normal to normal concept to understand what is the size of the device that we need to use. In other words, the stand length. I'm just gonna show you how the CT images have progressed over time. And I, I also combine this CT that you see here on the top, this straight NPR with the cross-section, with some cross-section as well coming from IVUS and even some virtual histology for you to see how easy it is to understand plaque composition by CT. And I'm focusing now on cross-section number two from left to right. And you see that there is a calcified plaque coming from three o'clock 
to uh, seven o'clock and you see exactly the same shadow in the IVOC image here. And this is of course corresponding to calcium. And you can see as well, and uh, here I like to show cross section, uh, this cross section, the fourth from the left to the right, because you actually see the fibrotic plaque in the CT. And no surprise, when you look at the IVOS, you see a very nice concentric plaque. And when you turn on your VH analysis, you see that everything is green. That means that is uh, fibrotic. So CT can really help us understanding the plaque composition that we're treating. And this is extremely relevant when we have severe calcifications because we know that severe calcifications are the type of plaque composition that hinders extent expansion. And when we have under expansion, this is one of the major predictors of target vessel failure. And CT can do this in a similar way to OCT and IVUS. We have validated the information coming from the calcium volume assessed by CT, and we have compared this with, with OCT. So what you see here in the X axis is calcium volume by CT, and in the Y axis, calcium volume by OCT. And you see there is a very nice correlation. And I just want to uh, warn you that the slope of this uh, uh, analysis is 1.61, meaning that yes, there is a linear correlation between CT and OCT, but CT overestimate the volume by 60%. But if we know that this overestimation is systematic as shown in the screen, we can indeed correct for this uh, assessment. So this is what we have done. And this is the next step that we took. So how to represent these MPRs that uh, the imagers, that the people reading CT are expert on, but interventional cardiologists actually were not trained at all and how to look MPRs and how to, uh, how to look at actual images. But we find a way to create a mesh not only for the lumen, but also to create a mesh and three-dimensionality of the plaque. And these are the reconstructions that we're using to have uh, to, to embed inside the catheterization laboratory during the procedure. This is a final case. This is a final reconstruction using this software. And you see, I, I think for the first time, the calcium in its full three-dimensionality. And this, is, this has a power to make you understand the disease that you are dealing with while you are doing your procedure. I'm going to show you how this works. This is our cat lab analysis, and I'm just taking this video for you to understand where are these images actually included. And you see here that I'm moving my C arm, and the geometry of the CT that is in the screen is moving with the C arm. So this is synchronized, and this, of course, help us that we know exactly what we're going to see on the screen before we even put the foot on the pedal and before we give contrast. And this indeed, of course, have other advantages as a potential reduction in contrast and radiation. So we have launched this, uh, this program of CT guided PCI. We are bringing also some elements from the intravascular world that we think that correlate pretty well uh, with what we have discussed previously. And we have developed this algorithm that we're testing prospectively. We call it the plan, MLD, and boost. And this is one of the alternatives that we have to guide our procedures with imaging exactly using the CT. The plan, is, uh, the, the plan of the algorithm is actually a lot of things that happen before the cat lab. So you understand better the coronary anatomy. You can se better select your guiding catheter based on the expected complexity of the disease. You understand where is the lesion before you actually start. This is actually important when you have osteo lesions. You understand the functional component, uh, in this case, FFRCT. Of course, plaque composition, we can look at a mask at risk and also understand the best projection. When we go to the MLD, this is exactly the same that we do in the cat lab with intravascular imaging, more precisely with OCT. So we use the CT to help us find a calcium that need to be treated before implanting the stent, otherwise the stent will not expand. We use the CT to assess the length in, in the sense of uh, what is the normal to normal length to land the stent. And finally, we use it also to assess the diameter uh, of, the, of the vessel, which of course we combine the diameter that is coming from the CT with the diameter that we see in geography. And finally, we take advantage of these new, uh, or not so new elements that, it, that we have in the cat lab, the so-called extent enhancements tool that can help us optimize our PCI in terms of extent expansion. We think that the assessment of, of plaque composition pre-PCI is actually one of the most important elements in any sort of image guided PCI. 
And why we say that? Because one of the things that we want to avoid is actually a standard expansion, but this actually can be predicted by the distribution and severity of the calcium in the pre-PCI model. The second thing that we use is the, the, the lesion length. And the only thing that we need to, to, to assess is that the place where we are landing our stand is actually free of disease. If you manage to land in a place free of disease, you actually reduce the probability to have, of course, residual disease in the edge and dissections. And I will not go for the other elements for the sake of time. But in a nutshell, this is all the information that we actually get from every single case. So to start with, we have what we call the, the 3D coronary anatomy overview. And of course, if you have this type of case that I'm showing you here in the first video, you will be prepared for a very complex procedure. We look at the Austin position, we understand plaque composition, we understand the mass at risk, which is something pretty simple to derive from CT, it's just one click. And this comes pretty handy when we're treating bifurcations and we are doubting whether we need to protect or not the side branch or, on, or the significance of the side branch. Then, of course, we have the 3D model with the angulations. And finally, and uh, equally important, is the functional component, not only in the diagnostic part of lesion significance, but also to predict what would happen if I put my stand here or there on the length of the stand. And we're going to elaborate on this later. This is the set of my cat lab here in Alps. This is an, another of our rooms. You see that the CT is always next to the conventional angiography. And this actually provides us an unprecedented uh, view of the type of coronary artery disease that, of course, we cannot see with conventional angiography. Uh, these are the steps of the CT guide, the PCI. I just want to show you a couple of elements. This is the software that we have developed. And this is a software, again, that you see next to your screen, and it has quite some uh, functionalities. So here you can measure the length of the disease. You see here how we're going to hide and put the calcium back and on to understand what is the distribution of the calcification. You can rotate the model any way you want. So you are working for the first time in a three-dimensional space. Uh, and then, of course, you can take advantage of these tools uh, that we use for, for measurements. You see there a straight NPR coming on, on, the, on the bottom of the screen. And this actually helps us measuring what is the distance from one point to the other. And this is, of course, pretty handy when you have to select a stent uh, length. And probably we'll have another video later on, but I just want to show you that this happens while we're doing the procedure in the cat lab. And here you have, of course, a precise measurement of any length in the, in the, of the coronary artery without worrying for foreshortening, overlapping, etc. We have discussed already about uh, calcified plaques, and this is something that we think is done extremely easy with CT. And this is more or less what we do in the cat lab. We look at the landing zones again, and this is, again, the, the picture of the prototype where we can derive the normal landing zones. There is concerning the, the diameters coming from CT. Uh, we have learned a lot in the last few years, and we know that all the diameters coming from CT are going to be smaller than the ones derived from IVUS. So we have an algorithm where the, any information coming from CT in diameters, we actually uh, round it up in terms of stent size. And uh, I don't have to tell you that the negative predicted value of CT is pretty high. This means that if you have a healthy distal reference uh, area or diameter, this will, ha will have a very high correlation with the dimensions coming from intravascular imaging. So lastly, this is the last part of the algorithm where we have this thing uh, that we call stent boost that is actually helping us expand the stent. And why I'm telling you all this? Because we have designed a randomized clinical trial, it's called P4, where we're actually uh, testing this technology in, uh, in a multi-center fashion. So we have included three sites from Italy, three sites from Belgium, two sites in Denmark, and five sites in the UK, and, and one site in Hungary, I mean, forgot, with the hypothesis that treating patients under this guidance using all the tools that we have discussed in the last minute results in a non-inferior outcomes compared to IVUS guided PCI, which in my opinion is the uh, state-of-the-art PCI today. And we're talking about a composite of cardiac death, a target vessel mark, calling infarction, and screaming driven target vessel vascularization at one year. In a nutshell, the design of the trial is what you have on the screen. So patients with severe coronary artery disease defined as uh, um, uh, diameter stenosis more than 70, 
and confirm FFRCT less than 0.8 will be randomized to these two groups, IVUS guided PCI and CT guided PCI, and then we'll have a non-inferiority primary endpoint at one year. So we'll be looking at MACE, of course, but we'll be also looking at some uh, uh, safety endpoints, as for example, radiation dose and contrast volume, that we think it's going to be reduced in the CTR, and of course, procedural efficacy in terms of post-PCI FFR, because we're planning the, the PCI with a tool that actually helps us predict the post-PCI FFR. And then we have linked this as well with patient reported outcomes at one year to see if the potential higher degree of functional revascularization is also observed in patients' complaint. Uh, I'm going to stop here, Leandro, and probably we will have time uh, for a short um, for a short uh, discussion. And if you agree, we can bring up later the the planner and do a few cases. But I would like to stop here and get some feedback from you, and then we can go with the cases. Yeah, thank you very much. I, I agree. I think that will be very interesting. And uh, congratulations in all this work. I think it's groundbreaking and. You know, I, I'm very excited to see it, and I'm sure you're very excited to see it come into reality, too. I know it's a lot of work that you put in it. Uh, so let's start with a few questions first. Uh, Dr. Garcia is here. I don't know if Dr. Garcia would like to start. Hi, Carlos. I, <clears throat> uh, first of all, I, I regret that uh, we didn't have our interventional faculty present here because I think this would have been great for them to see. Um, this is uh, fantastic, the work that you've done. And... You make it very hard for me because I have written about eight questions, but you answer them one by one through your presentation. So you left me nothing here. Um, I was gonna ask you about sizing of the stent. I was gonna ask you about um, reducing uh, X-ray dose and contrast. Uh, so you, you already have the answers for that. So let me ask you just maybe a, a more, um, I guess, uh, fundamental question. Do you ever use a stress test? And when? <laughs> yeah, so uh, here we actually use uh, CT as a first line test for patients with suspected coronary artery disease. But we do, uh, I do use stress tests. And when I do that, it's actually in patients with stents, uh, I, I think that these patients are very difficult to assess with CT, with the exception of probably left main stents that are very big. If you have a stent in the mid portion of the vessels, it's very difficult to assess with CT. So we, we normally use, let's say, other functional non-invasive tests. But Mario, I think that 90% of our patients go to, to CT. Yeah, that, that looks great. And uh, so that, that was going to be my question related to that. So uh, with the CT planner, you can plan how the stent will change the FFR. Uh, but there's still no, if you have any stents present, FFR cannot be done, FFRCT, right? Yeah, that is correct. And it's an important remark. I didn't put the exclusion criteria for the sake of time, but from the validation of the planner, we excluded patients uh, previously treated with PCI. So the accuracy of both of the FFRCT itself and of the planner in patients with stent has not been full, fully studied. That's an important remark, Leandro. And who do you send for, uh, for this? Are you sending every patient or you, how, how do you ambition this will be used? Well, that's an interesting question. And, and I, I like the, the forum that we have here today because you know what is happening is that we as an interventional cardiologist, we're starting to realize that uh, our, there are two types of disease. There are focal disease and diffuse disease. And nobody will uh, argue that when you do a PCI in focal disease, that is a good uh, choice in the sense that that is a relatively simple procedure, the complications are lower, the patients get better in terms of angina, etc. But PCI and diffuse disease is associated with low post PCI FFR. These patients have a higher rate of cardiac death and MI. And this is a subset of patients that so far all these patients have been put in the same in the same bag in all the trials. So for the first time, we have a tool that tells us if you do PCI in this case, you will, be, you will have very high post-PCI FFR, and this patient might do better than the other patient. So this actually is breaking a paradigm in, in, in coronary artery disease. And I am seeing coronary artery disease now as two different entities. Focal disease, that's good for some things. Diffuse disease that are very difficult to treat. Now, to try to answer your question, how do I see this technology being used? 
I think that it's going to be in the hands of the cardiologist, you know, in the consultation office and understanding what would be the hypothetical result of a PCI and showing that to the patient and say, really, I really don't see a big benefit. You have a diffuse disease or you have, we expect to have high benefit of an intervention. So I will go probably earlier to the cat lab. So I think that all these new developments, this new technology is very difficult to keep the pace in terms of clinical trial, because when we decide today to start a trial, we finish in 10 years and then everything is obsolete. But okay, this is the way that we try to catch up with new technology, but this is a break, uh, ground breakthrough technology. Great. Uh, Aldo is also here. I don't know if Aldo or Asim, if you have any questions. Yeah, I, I, well, Dr. Latif first, then I'll... Ah, no, no worries. I have a, I have a few questions, uh, but you know, my first comment was to Dr. Garcia. Your interventional faculty easier, by the way. Um, <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, Carla, so great to see you, um, and I love your talk. Uh, you know, being someone who does both coronary and structural interventions, um, you know, I'm a huge believer in CT. I love the fact that when I walk into the cat lab and if I have a CT, I have just so much more information and there's no guesswork, right? So it really is fantastic, and I think you've now set a very high bar of what my expectations are from Leandro, Mario, and Aldo. They're gonna, they're gonna like up their game now uh, in what they give me so that I can do my job even better. Um, so I have a couple of questions. Let's start with the first one. Um, in our community here in the Bronx, um, you know, we have a very high burden of disease, diabetes, end-stage renal disease. And a lot of calcific disease and not focal calcium like the example you showed us but very diffuse calcium um limitations of of this in patients with more diffuse calcium so one of the things uh, i think that we have realized is that when you uh, look at the ct so at the beginning let's make a kind of an historical uh, uh perspective here when you had a lot of calcium in the ct uh you said i cannot analyze the image and I'll tell you what happened here. I sit down with my colleagues, the radiologists here, and we were looking at the same image. And he was thinking, oh, you know, this is severity. I cannot really tell you, Carlos, maybe, maybe severe, maybe not. And in my head, as him, it was, I have to take the rotablator out. I have to take the IVL out. So the same image, yeah. two different people, completely different uh, ideas. So in my view, uh, and I have to tell you here, sometimes when we have a patient that comes into the cat lab without a CT, and there is a question whether the calcium, so sometimes I have colleagues that have say, stop, send it to CT, let's see the calcium burden, and then I will apply my PCI better. So this is where we have gotten. And I think that we as an interventional cardiologist assess the calcium completely different from the people actually writing the reports. So yeah. this is something that I see that us, as an interventional cardiologist, CT it will be a must in the core curriculum for the next decade. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I, I love the fact that I can bring it into the cath lab, you know, and be able to go into the same projection I'm in uh, on Flora or find the perfect projection to, to delineate a LED diagonal bifurcation, right? Because I still see angiography um, done by colleagues where they're treating bifurcations and they're in the completely wrong projection. Or they're trying to treat an auto-osteal lesion and they can't find the true osteum and they're missing the osteum, right? So, I mean, there are all these other applications which I think are great. Um, you, know, you, you, you work in ALST. ALST is, is kind of the home of functional imaging, right? And, and functional um, FFR and everything we do using FFR comes from ALST. So I have to ask, I mean, one of the areas I've been fascinated about, about how it's going to impact the cath lab is angio FFR. Um, and I wonder if we do have angio FFR that's easily done, will it replace some of the um, um, functionality of what you're showing? So, well, I have to tell you uh, two things. One uh, is that this um, FFR CT information is uh, one of the unique things is that you have this in your consultation. So this is fully non-invasive based on CT and that has of course a big advantage. But now when you cross the line of invasiveness and you are already in the cath lab 
and you are using this uh, uh, invasive, the functional angio, uh, of course, the angiography has higher resolution compared to CT. So I do believe that there is an increase in accuracy when you derive the FFR from the angiography compared to the CT. In addition to that, I have to also uh, be uh, clear that when you have a lot of calcium, it's very difficult to derive all this information coming from CT, mainly because the, the calcium hampers a lot the segmentation of the vessel. Right. So I do think that this has an incremental value. Now, the tools that we have today, and, and you are right, we have five FFR annual machines in the cat lab here. <laughs> so they are not yet there. You have to stop, take your glove, do the QCA. Yeah. But, but this will improve, you know. Uh, and, right. and I, I believe, Azim, that you and I, we're going, still going to see you know, inject, do nothing, and get your FFR. That, that will come. <laughs> That's a dream. That's a dream. That's a dream. <laughs> so I'm going to ask you one last question. Sorry, Leandro. I mean, and then I'll pass it on to the other colleagues. So talking about your randomized trial, I've, I've been hearing a lot about it. You know, one of some of my colleagues are going to be a site at Humanitas, and, they, and they're very excited. Uh, Antonio was there a few days ago telling me how excited he is about the study. So congratulations. Um. So I wonder, you know, at, at Monty, we a center, we do intravascular imaging in 80 to 90% of, the, of our PCIs. That's as a center. So in the 2000 PCIs we do, ima it's image guided in 80 to 90%. Okay, so we have a very high image guidance. We're real believers in, in image guidance. When I look at the study and I say, okay, you're gonna show me that CT guided PCI is non-inferior to what we do already. Uh, where's the advantage then? for a center like ours, um, where we do so much uh, you know, intravascular imaging? So the, I think that, well, you are preaching to the priest. Uh, we are also, uh, we do a lot of intravascular imaging, but as in, you know, I was pretty surprised. I saw recently the publication of the registry, uh, PCR registry of the US. The use of intravascular imaging nationwide is very, very low. In Absolutely. that publication, it's about less than 5%. If you talk to the industry, 10, 15%. So there are 80% of the PCIs which are actually done without any sort of imaging guidance. And this is where this technology actually is filling the, 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 the need. The second part is that when you have this, the, the trial itself going to the design, the idea to prove that is that we have non-inferiority in terms of outcomes, but we have superiority in terms of resource utilization, because of course the CT is acquired anyway in the diagnostic setting. We're just using something that is sitting in the packs and just put inside the catalog with, with a new tool. But I think that that will of course increase the cost effectiveness of the interventions that we're doing. And I'm not saying that this will replace intravascular imaging because in my view it will not, but indeed will increase the awareness of the types of plaques that we're actually treating with PCI. That's great. Carlos, I appreciate that. And, and I appreciate your comments. I, I feel bad for Mark Trevin because I think he's going to have to start learning how to interpret CTs very soon. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Thanks again, Carlos. I'm going to pass on to Mark. <laughs> Yeah, I, uh, that, that was my question, you know, where, where's the role for cardiac PET? So I saw one with stents, okay, we could still do it there. Probably diffuse disease and maybe following treatments for plaque, you know, blood flow through plaques. I, I think that's an untapped uh, area. Well, but one thing, what about bypass grafts? Any, any work uh, that you've done with that? Or do we still have... We still well, do. That, that's a fantastic point. And uh, well, let me tell you what, what I believe. Uh, and this is probably for the second generation of this technology. And, and you know, when, when we receive a patient after uh, CABG in the cat lab, and in many cases, we have no real clue what was done in the surgery. This is frequently the case in our lab. Then we start just looking for uh, where the bypass is. And that takes a lot of contrast. That takes a lot of radiation and sometimes we end up taking decisions that are not the right ones. So in, in my view, when you have a patient that has already been operated and is sent to the cat lab, having the map of where the bypass is located, if it's open or not, it's extremely useful to reduce radiation, to reduce contrast volume and to increase the, the, the safety of a, of a normal diagnostic angio. So, 
Uh, I think that patients post uh, uh, surgery are very well evaluated with CT, what concerns the graft. In addition to that, as you may know, and Leandro and Aldo, the graft doesn't move. So they, they, you can see them pretty nicely with, with the CT. Of course, the native vessel sometimes is an issue because they are very calcified. Sometimes these patients become challenging uh, to, to really assess. So I think that the role of, of perfusion, PET or, or SPECT, they have a role in this particular scenario to understand whether the complaints of the patient are related or not to ischemia. But again, for the procedural guidance itself, I think that this has a huge value for us as an interventional cardiologist. What about related to Dr. Chavin asked, what about the morbidly obese patients? Do you see any type of, uh, if the image degrades, any type of higher noise affecting this? Th that's a very good comment, Leandro. And, and I think we have also to put this in, 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 in perspective. CT is not for every patient. Uh, so we have patients, of course, with atrial fibrillation and fast heart rates that the image quality doesn't allow to, to do what I just showed you. Uh, all the, the obese patients are typically systematically excluded from all these CT trials. So BMI above 35, these are bad candidates for CT. So yeah, this is uh, something that we have to recognize the limitation of the technology. And Carlos, I wanted to ask yeah. you uh, from the practical perspective, how often uh, do you do the CT diagnostic and the intervention on the same day? And the second question, do you ever consider, uh, would you be of any value uh, to do this in patients who had uh, a presentation acute with an end STEMI? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. So here uh, we have a time window between the interventional procedure and uh, uh, between the CT and the interventional procedure that is uh, sometimes a week or, or two, depending on the disease severity. Uh, it's my dream, Mario, to have to take one cat lab out of the, of, the, of, of the cat lab room and put a CT there and have all the patients coming first to CT and then to the cat lab. That is my dream, but we're not yet there. Uh, so that will be, uh, I think, that uh, the, next, uh, <laughs> the next frontier for, for us to have CT for, for everyone. Sorry, Mario, I forgot your second question. Can you repeat it? If you ever would consider doing um, a CT in a patient who presents with an end STEMI? Well, we do have in here, we have a, our chest pain clinic. Uh, so our emergency department relied a lot on, uh, on, on CT. Uh, and we have an algorithm of that the patient's coming because with this triple rule out and we systematically gate that with the ECG. So we have coronaries as well. So we do quite a lot of CT in the acute setting. Uh, the, the, you know, the resolution of the acute patient is quite fast. Uh, you can say 24, 48 hours. So there is not sufficient time to have all these things done and, and work out. Uh, so I see that this val the value of the, these tools are more for the stable patient, at least today. Okay. Mario, Leandro, I just, I'm sharing the screen now. This is the, the one of the cases that we have in the trial. And this is a, a very complicated disease because when you look at the, this is the LAD in the middle, I'm gonna make a zoom here in the LAD so you to understand the type of disease that we have. So all these circles are automatic detection of stenosis by the, by the system. And what I can do now is let, let's say, okay, I have a lot of disease here. I'm gonna start placing a stand here. Probably this stand is too short. I'm gonna extend it until here. And I'm gonna place here a 38 millimeter stand and see what happened with my post PCFFR. And I immediately see here that this is actually not a good stent strategy in the sense that I'm not covering all the lesions and the post-PCFFR will be very low. So probably the best solution will be to put, look at this 88 millimeters of stent in an LAD, which we know that is not the best probably uh, uh, idea to place such a long uh, um, uh, yeah, stent and metal in this LAD. So what this tool is actually telling us, and I can remove this stent right away and tell you that uh, this patient, when you are trying to define what is your best treatment option and you can understand the potential results or the potential strategy that you would need to use to achieve a, a meaningful result actually will 
generate almost a full metal jacket in the LAD. And this is a patient I think that might be best considered for, for a Lima or something else. So this is the way that we see the technology. I'm going to show you one more case that is actually one of my favorites. So cases. Carlos, can I, can I ask while you opening that case? I mean, two questions. I mean, the one is, if there's such diffuse disease, where are you going to put the memory, right? Is it going to stay patent? And the second part of that is, you know, I, I'm a big disbeliever. I think we, full metal jackets should be banned. Um, and you should only be allowed like a certain amount in your lifespan as an interventional cardiologist and then no more. Um, but we do have other technologies now, particularly in Europe, like drug coated balloons, right, for diffuse disease. Do you think there's any role for that in that kind of case? Definitely, yes. And I have to say, I think that the, the drug coating balloon trial is ongoing and they're using post PCFFR to assess the result of the drug coating balloon. So I think this is a promising technology to treat diffuse disease. And I have seen Professor Colombo doing some of the cases and the results are just superb. L let me move to the next case, Azim, and I'm going to ask your help here, and probably Leandro and Mario as well. And now please jump in. This is a patient that comes with a positive uh, uh, exercise test, okay? Uh, three millimeter depression. And then we send this, this, uh, this uh, young uh, gentleman to a CT. And we found that this patient actually has two lesions in the LAD. And when we look at the FFR, where we would measure this in the cat lab is about 73. But the question is, can we help this, this patient? So uh, probably Mario, I think that we have two lesions here and we can start deciding. And I think that this lesion here looks a little bit more severe than this one, but both are more or less 50, 60%. And this is producing a low post PC FFR that if we look at the pressure drop, it's kind of diffuse. You see, the translational gradient is not huge. It's like five FFRCT points for the proximal lesion mm -hmm. and like, uh, let's say, a little bit like uh, eight FFRCT point for the, for the distal lesion. So I would tell you that this person, this, this guy is asymptomatic, okay, mm -hmm. but with ischemia, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, let me tell you what happened. What, what would you like to treat first, Mario? The first one, the proximal or the distal lesion? <laughs> well, you're right. It, look, it looks like uh, I, I would be concerned that the gradual, of the, about the gradual drop, uh, uh, which mm, suggests that neither of them uh, would completely address the situation. The, the, the question that I have is, would this change uh, depending on the use of vasodilators at the time of the CT? And I assume that routinely you use nitroglycerin uh, before the acquisition. Yeah, th that's a very good question. And the answer is yes. We need to have full vasodilation and we have a sub analysis I didn't present it today of the accuracy of the planner stratified by the nitroglycerin dose. Mm -hmm. And in, there is lower accuracy of this tool when the load, when there is no nitroglycerin during the CT acquisition, or is a low dose 0 0.4 milligrams. So you are completely right. The accuracy of this tool depends on a good CT acquisition. And you know what that means? Heart rate, heart rate, heart rate, and nitrates. Right. Uh, so look at this gentleman. So if you think that we could place one stand here in the proximal part and you open this, the FFR went from 78 to 80. And then you might say, well, this probably might not be the best solution. The patient is again asymptomatic. So let's add a second stand here in the mid portion of the vessel and let's see what happened. And it comes from 82. So after putting two stents, now the patient have two stents in the vessel, the FFR increased 0 0.04 points. So the amount of the degree of functional revascularization achieved by these two stents is minimal. Now the patient has two stents in the LED. He has to take the APT. And in my view, in the future, this type of patient, especially because he's asymptomatic, will not be referred to the cat lab because these are the patients that can be safely managed with medical therapy. And this is, for me, one of the, the things that will change in terms of how do we assess coronary artery disease and in patients that actually have little benefit of going to the cat lab and be treated with PCR. Let me just uh, uh, challenge you with a question here. 
don't you think that it's possible that once you increase flow by dilating a proximal uh, lesion, the diameter of the vessel uh, distal to the, to the lesion that is treated will increase. And, and then one of the limitations that we have here is that we're uh, looking at the anatomy in the setting of um, reduced intra, intracoronary pressure. That is true, Mario, but for very tight lesions. So what we're seeing now on the screens are moderate lesions. I don't think that these lesions actually, uh, did you see the pressure drop to this lesion is minimal. So this will not really influence your distal diameter, but what you said is true, especially if you have a very tight lesion that reduces the flow sufficiently to actually reduce the normal dilation of the vessel distal to the stenosis. So there is a very good point that you made. And the, the, the question that I have for you, Carlos, too, I mean, right here, we're looking at the lumen. Um, uh, do you take into consideration, uh, I, I guess, the, the, the burden of, of plaque in the wall? Yes, so this is uh, at this stage, and, and I think that we are, I, 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 I told to our colleagues, uh, uh, a team of humanitas that came here, that we are actually launching a new field and we need actually a lot of companies to help us with this in the sense that the FFRCT is coming from one vendor, the other analysis of the plaque is coming from another uh, vendor, and we're just using all this in the trial. But at, in the future, I think that we have to look at these two things, Mario, that you have mentioned. One is anatomy. For us in the cat lab, it's extremely important to know the plaque composition and to know where the calcium is located. But also at physiology, because physiology is going to tell us not only if the lesion is significant or not, but whether we can really help that patient with PCI. And I think it's the integration of all this information that will actually be a breakthrough in the, in the, in the treatment of patients with coronary artery disease. Carlos, can I ask a question too, and maybe challenge you on this. Um, a lot of these predictions about the post PCI or post stent FFR because you know Volcano is doing that or Philips is doing that as well uh, with their software is based on the fact that if you put a stent on a certain length you completely correct the FFR drop in that stent area all right uh, it's based on that it's very simple math in reality when you look at the post FFR studies whether it's defined PCR or even uh, many of the real world studies it's actually, even when you have focal lesions sometimes, um, it, can be def it can be difficult to completely correct the FFR. That often you put a stent, you think it's well implanted, you do the FFR, and the FFR is still down, all right? It's not above 0 0.9 because there's more diffuse disease in the vessel. Maybe the stent needs to be post dilated. There's other things going on in the vessel, all right? So, I mean, I always have a challenge when I see these models saying, okay, I'm going to take the FFR from this to that with a stent, it's based on, on a prediction, but the prediction has some faults in it because it means I do have to implant the stent perfectly. I need to get perfect stent implantation. And it means that the distal disease is, doesn't impact it really. And we know that's not completely true. So, I mean, how do we take this into account? You're on mute, Carlos. Sorry. So uh, that, that is a, a fantastic comment. And, and I'm gonna tell you the way I see the field. Uh, I think that we have to be more thoughtful on the patients that we select for PCI. And I think that doing PCI in diffuse disease, it's something that we will have to avoid. So, you know, you're telling me about this diffuse disease and you put a stent. To start with, I don't, I don't think that that would be a patient that should be treated with PCI unless very particular clinical circumstances. But I think that in the future we'll be more selective to, 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 to treat patients with PCI, specifically stable patients. Uh, and then we will select the patients that will benefit the most, that will be the patients with focal disease, in my opinion. And then we will avoid all these complications also associated with PCI and diffuse disease. So in my view, Azim, and this is something I would like to challenge you as well, is that the next uh, ischemia light trial I think if we only include the lesions, the focal lesions, the one that we are certain that we're doing a good job, I'm pretty sure that we're going to get rid of all these periprocial complications, periprocial MIs, and we may have the chance to have for the first time a paper saying that 
PCI superior to medical therapy in a subset of a stable patient with coronary artery disease. <laughs> Only if we use CTFFR pre <laughs> and we use IVUS during the procedure, then maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see, Aldo had a question too. Yeah, no, I, I think that uh, I think all the kind of different questions were kind of answered already. But I think I I, I really love the presentation, uh, um, you know, for for many many reasons. But uh, the one that I like the most is is that concept that uh, of diffuse and focal focal disease. Uh, this is something that I you know in my short experience we have seen we have been seen for you know quite some some time, especially in the setting of these people that you send for stress tests is you know barely positive stress tests you send for the cat lab. And then the, the CAT lab comes as a non-obstructive disease and it's a false negative stress test, which is, you know, we're just not taking into account that the diffuse disease can lead to ischemia. And, and, and uh, the concept that you just brought, which I think is, is exceptional. And, and that's the way I've, I've been trying to see the disease in, in which, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a focal disease or it's just a diffuse disease, it's focal on diffuse. You're trying to understand uh, how to deal with that in a better way, I think is, is, is a way to go. Um, and in fact, um, on the, in the nuclear uh, world, that's what we have been trying to do. I mean, in my training in PET, uh, we were trying to do these kind of PET FFR and try to see if there was a gradient uh, from base to apex that we would see a drop from base to beat or, or it was just a gradual decline. And that would inform uh, beyond the presence of positive or negative, this is something you should treat with medications versus uh, kind of stenting. So I think it's, it's, it's totally brilliant. Um, I guess the only question left that I can ask is like, what's the rate Okay, so we say that we're excluding the obese patients, we are excluding all the different, you know, people that I think it wouldn't be ideal. So what's the rate of non-diagnostic testing that, you, you, that you're getting? So it's just your 100% of people, you still kind of can analyze it or how many of those you say, well, these people cannot, uh, you know. Well, uh, uh, from the plaque reconstruction, reconstruction perspective, this is above the, the 90%, I would say. Uh, we just exclude the very, very high calcifications where we really have no, no free, you cannot analyze the image. And from the FFRCT perspective, of course, accounting for this exclusion criteria that we mentioned, but we use this in clinical practice, our acceptance rate is about 97%. Right. So this is the vast majority of the patient. There is indeed a subset that you cannot analyze, but the vast majority comes through this pathway. Excellent. Thanks. Thank you very much. I think trying to answer some of the, some of the questions. Uh, one question is if you would change the outcomes in, in that patient just by improving the distal FFR. And I think related to that is it could be some microvascular disease as well in that, that case we're showing. Well, the interplay of, of microvascular disease is certainly something important that we have to, to acknowledge. Uh, but in the you have to also remember that there is no real association between epicardial disease and microvascular disease. And you have seen this uh, several times in these plots, you know, comparing FFR with IMR. There is absolute not correlation between these two types of, of disease. But again, you know, I'm a big uh, believer in microvascular dysfunction. Uh, this is one of my fields of, uh, that I, I am passionate about. It. So yes, I think that it's, it's quite interesting to look at the microvascular function, but probably we don't have time today to dwell into, into that. Uh, I think it's just trying to go fast through these questions for people that have been waiting to, you know, to talk to you. Do you stop by any calcium score? You do a calcium score before the CCTA. Do you ever stop or you always inject? Always inject. Okay, good. And do you predict the use of rotablator, for example? Definitely. I have to tell you that I work with Emanuele Barbato and he doesn't do a PCI without a CT today. And uh, he's the guy doing most rota here. And then he just is, uh, he, he took two or three cases and he's a believer. He goes only with the CT and rota and then goes up. Yes, definitely. Yes. Coronary anomalies. Do you use the planner or not? Coronary anomalies and the planner. Actually, uh, I have zero experience with coronary anomalies and the planner. Okay. And I think the, and the last one is, uh, did you try to derive PPG from CTFFR pullback? Yes, and the paper is coming soon. Uh, <laughs> so it's, it's quite nice. Uh, but yes, I think we, we are now understanding that diffuse disease is prevalent. 
that diffuse disease is associated with residual complaints after PCI. And uh, in addition to that, that is associated as well with periprocele MI. So it's like the, all the worst thing that can happen happens in diffuse disease when you go to the cat lab. And the last one, and related, I think, to the Scott Hart now data on asymptomatic people, do you think we will be using uh, FFR as a composite score? I know there are some people working in these uh, scores for, for cardiovascular risk. Do you, do you see, do you see that, that as a possibility? So plaque analysis plus FFR in all the vessels? Definitely. You have seen the power that uh, analysis, the, the analysis of the plaque composition have. You see, for example, the combine, a study showing negative FFRCT lesions with uh, thin cat fibrotromas, they do worse. So I think this is a synergism. And this is why CT is fantastic because it tells you the two stories, the physiology in the vessel, with a couple of you know technological uh, uh, virtual stenting stuff, and in addition to that, you have you have the complete plaque information. And I focus the talk on calcium, but you know pretty well that we can see low attenuation plaque, positive remodel plaque, and this is also associated with risk. So definitely yes. Okay, great. So thank you very much. That was outstanding, uh, and we took the whole hour and a little bit more. So. So thank you very much, and hopefully you'll come visit us soon in New York, or we'll yeah. be in. Great. Leandro, can I can I make a last comment? Um, yeah, sure. I, I want to remind everybody that Carlos is an interventional cardiologist. Okay, because everybody thinks us interventional cardiologists want to put stents in, but there's also many of us who are very thoughtful about how we do it, and we want to do a better job. So I want to congratulate Carlos for that, and secondly, I want to congratulate him for highlighting to people that coronary intervention is no is not dead, it's not boring, it's very exciting, and the work you're doing in Alst is incredible. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you very much to the whole Montefiore team, Leandro, Asim, Aldo, Mark, and Mario. It was really a pleasure for me, and uh, thank you so much for the invitation, and I hope to see you soon in person. See you soon.